Welcome back. This will be the third video in section 5.3. Uh, in this video, we're going to go over proposition 5.3.3 as well as 5.3.4, and we'll give both the statements and the proofs. Uh, let's start with a little recall, a reminder of a definition that we gave a while ago, which is that uh, two matrices, A and B, are said to be row equivalent, and the notation is this little equivalent sign, if there exists a sequence of elementary row operations, we'll call them O1, O2, all the way to OK, that turns A into B, right? So the notation, I use this notation here to say that uh, starting from A, if I apply O1, I get A1, and I apply O2, I get A2, and so forth, until we get to B, okay? So in general, think of the notation like this. I don't want to make this too cumbersome, but we do have to agree on some notation. So I'll say like this, if you put AI minus 1 on the left, and let's say AI here, and this is operation OI. Okay, so OI turns AI minus 1 into AI. So just keep that notation in mind because we're going to use it in a second uh, and be in the proof of the propositions. Okay, so let's read the statements together. So proposition 5.3.3 says that if A is row equivalent to B, then there exists a sequence of elementary matrices E1, E2, all the way to EK, such that EK times ek minus 1, all the way down to e1 times a equals b. So you notice the order in which we're multiplying the elementary matrices is reverse order in which we listed them. And I'll show you why that is in a second. Okay, so the statement is that if there are operations that go from a to b, a sequence of operations, then there's a sequence of elementary matrices, and you notice it's the same number of matrices as we gave of operations, so k operations and k matrices. And so let's take a look at what this means. So think of the matrix, the first one, say matrix E1, as um, elementary matrix. So if E1 is the elementary matrix associated to the first operation, so associated to uh, O1, right? What does that mean? Well, in other words, if you start from I and you apply O1, you get E1. Okay, so that's what we mean by the matrix E1. It's associated to the operation O1. But then, doesn't that mean that if you left multiply A by E1, then you obtain A1, right? Why is that? Well, it's because in the notation that we wrote above, we said that A becomes A1 when you apply operation 1 to it, right? Remember, we noticed that applying an elementary row operation to a matrix is the same as left multiplying that matrix by the corresponding elementary matrix, right? And so E1 times A equals A1, just like a becomes A1 when we apply O1 to it. And so the same way we wrote this for E1, I'm going to write the same thing for E2. So E2 is the elementary matrix uh, associated, associated to O2, the second operation. In other words, uh, if you start from I and you apply O2, you get E2. That's what we mean by that operation or that matrix. But then wouldn't you agree that if I multiply E2 times E1 times A, I'm going to get A2, right? Why is that? Well, because, think of it this way, uh, in the notation we wrote above, we wrote that A1 becomes A2 once we apply O2. Remember that? But we, again, notice that applying O2 to A1, right, is the same thing as mul left multiplying E2 by A1. But isn't this A1, right? This was our A1 that we computed in the first step. And so multiplying E2 by A1 is the same thing as applying O2 to A1, and in both cases we obtain A2. So you can see where this is going, right? If you keep going with this process, and so I'll write the last one, I'll say if EK is the elementary matrix, elementary matrix associated, associated, to OK, the operation OK, which means, of course, that it's the operation that if you apply it directly to I, gives you the matrix EK. Well then, again, with the same reasoning we just used, wouldn't you agree that this EK times, let's say, EK minus 1, all the way down to E1A, well, this will be matrix B. Why matrix B? Well, because, remember in the notation we wrote above, we wrote that if you have AK minus 1 and you apply OK to it, you get B. Remember that? So if we scroll back up a second, you notice here the last, the last statement here is 
ak minus 1, if you apply ok to it, you get b. And so that's exactly what we're doing down here. And so, uh, just like before, we noticed that applying ok directly to the matrix ak minus 1 has the same effect as left multiplying, as left multiplying the matrix, uh, this is the matrix ak minus 1, right? This whole product. And left multiplying that by ek has the same effect as applying OK directly to AK minus 1. Okay, hopefully I haven't lost you with the notation, but you can see why it was necessary to define uh, the above notation so that we can we can uh, uh, explain the procedure this way. Okay, but this means that we've proven our statement because isn't this exactly the statement we wanted to prove? And you notice why the reverse order now, eh? Because the operation O1 was the first one we applied to A, but that means that E1 has to be the matrix that is closest to A, right? To the left of A, and closest to A. And once we apply operation 2, then we have E2, and that's going to be the next matrix, and so forth, working your way outward toward EK. Okay, so hopefully that proof is clear, and that ends the proof. And that allows us to state proposition 5.3.4, which is just an extension of this, because proposition 5.3.4 says, if A is row equivalent to B, then there exists an invertible matrix P, such that P times A equals B. But this is really just a direct consequence of what we just proved, right? Because in the previous proposition, we said that if A is row equivalent to B, then there exists a sequence. There exists a sequence of elementary matrices, of elementary matrices, such that, such that, and so I'm going to write them just like, like I did above, E, K, all the way down to E1 times A equals B, right? That's what we just proved. But you notice this product of K matrices, we can just give it a name. Let's call it matrix P, right? Once you multiply out the, all these matrices, well, that's going to be uh, a matrix B, i.e. we can say that P A equals B, right? Where the matrix, so the matrix P is the product of E K all the way to E1. Carefully, I'm not putting commas here because this is actual actual product. I'm not just listing the matrices, I'm multiplying them. And so this matrix P, well, it's a product of elementary matrices, product of elementary matrices. But remember, we proved in a previous proposition that every elementary matrix is invertible, and therefore uh, P is also a product of invertible matrices. Therefore, P is a product product of invertible matrices, because each one of those elementary matrices is invertible. But a product of invertible matrices is invertible. Remember the property that we saw a while back? So I'm going to state it first. Uh, and therefore, P is invertible. Invertible. Okay. Why is that? Well, you might recall a little while back, um, here, I'll put it in bracket, uh, I'll say recall, that uh, we said oh, right here that if you have k matrices, a k, and they're all invertible, are invertible, uh, then their product is also invertible. And in fact, a one dot 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 a k inverse. Remember this is equal to a k inverse times all the way to a one inverse. Sorry, these should be three dots, not four or five. Do uh, you remember that? So it was uh, we apply the inverse to each matrix, but we reverse the order. Okay, so that property uh, was telling us that a product of invertible matrices is itself invertible, and you can write it out like that. And therefore, the matrix P that we uh, described as the product E K to E one, that matrix P is invertible, and we have P A equals B. And that concludes the proof. And